today on Mother Mayhem. You're not used to taking up space. You're not used to the idea that whatever you're thinking about or feeling or working through is important or is significant. And you tell yourself that other people's stories matter so much more. That's part of the narcissistic abuse recovery work is to recognize that you matter, your story matters, and that what happened to you in your truth is just as important as somebody else's truth. Welcome back to Mother Mayhem, the Narcissistic Abuse Recovery Podcast for Daughters. Hi, I'm your host, Heather Gray, and I'm so very glad you're here with me today. With each passing week where I put new episodes out, I'm getting more and more messages from you listeners, other women just like you sitting and hearing the information and recognizing and seeing themselves and the stories and the examples I'm providing. I'm really starting to feel in each passing week that we're on the cusp of really building a community of women in it together who are rooting for each other, listening to each other, and seeing themselves in each other. I couldn't be more proud, and I couldn't be more grateful for the support all of you are showing this show. Thank you so very much. Now, it's pretty hard to get far into the narcissistic abuse recovery discussions before we start hearing the term gaslighting. It's a term used to describe how your mom might have distorted or manipulated your version of events by challenging or minimizing your own narrative. In a bold, clear-cut example, she may have rewritten entire versions of your life and turned them into something they weren't. She likely at times flat out lied while manipulating your feelings, and this was often done to exert power and control. If you've been a chronic target of your mom's lies and manipulations, it's really possible that you're struggling with self-doubt and self-confidence, and you might be finding it hard to make decisions or trust your judgment because you've become so accustomed to second-guessing yourself or your version of events. And at this point, after all this time, it really is possible that you've grown so accustomed to second-guessing yourself because of your mom that you've actually ended up internalizing her perception of you, and it's become part of your own perception of yourself. In her attempts to control you, she may have played you off as too sensitive, too weak, Perhaps she implied that you were lacking intelligence, or she might have made some other kind of comment that was otherwise demeaning, and it was always done to suit her need and keep you in whatever place she deemed acceptable. In our third episode together, I talked with you about how after a childhood with a narcissistic mom, you might be struggling with knowing yourself. If you haven't listened to that episode yet, it's a really good episode to go back to because what I was talking about then is very much related to what we're talking about today because it's my intention in doing this and helping you have a better relationship with yourself. We are going to get you to stop gaslighting yourself. It's become an internalized pattern of yours to doubt yourself, second guess yourself, minimize your experience, minimize your feelings, and minimize the things that you're thinking and feeling. We want to help you have a better relationship with yourself by doing some of those core things that we talked about back in the third episode. But what we really want to do for the sake of today's conversation is break that habitual pattern of self manipulating or self-gaslighting, where you're telling yourself that you aren't really thinking what you're thinking, or you shouldn't be feeling what you're feeling, or that you're overreacting. And as you hear me say this, if it feels familiar to you, then again, you're right where you're supposed to be. And this is the conversation we're supposed to be having right now. Because when we start thinking about this, and framing this discussion out a little bit, I have to be honest with you that I roll my eyes at it. The idea that I was going to tell you to stop self-gaslighting yourselves sounded so clickbaity and dramatic. 
But it really is that because when you're undermining yourself and you're questioning your truth and you're minimizing your version of events, you really are gaslighting yourself. And if we were talking about your mom doing these things, we would be calling her how and we would be calling that spade a spade and we would be looking to disrupt that pattern and its effect on you. And if we say that when you do this to yourselves, that you're just lacking confidence or you struggle with decision making, we're just not getting to the root of the problem. So for today's conversation, I want to outline for you what gaslighting very much likely looks like for you and your regular every day. And I want to begin offering you tools and strategies that you can implement today to start breaking that pattern. Because again, it's this habitual way you have grown accustomed to thinking about yourself, your own feelings, and your own experiences. So now you're at the point where that inner voice you hear in your head, it's just running on automatic pilot. And you may not even think or feel those things anyway. You're just so used to thinking and feeling those things that you haven't figured out a way to stop thinking or feeling them. I'm going to outline it today so we know what it looks like, so that when you hear that voice in your head, you know which voice you're redirecting and trying to send in another direction. And I'm going to be offering you the tools and strategies to feel more in control and to know what to do instead and how to start thinking about these things differently. When I started thinking about having this conversation with all of you today, I started to realize that the biggest thing that I see in my practice with women is that they have this habitual pattern of minimizing or denying their own emotions. Your mom never or very rarely validated your feelings, and as a result, you just never learned how to do this for yourselves. Now, this is what it looks like. You might be used to, for example, hearing yourself say or think things like, maybe I'm just overreacting. I really shouldn't be feeling this way. Or perhaps that inner voice you hear in your head is more blaming or criticizing. And you might be hearing yourself say from time to time, or for some of you, every day, it's my fault that so-and-so is mad at me. I shouldn't have said what I said when I said it, or I probably misinterpreted the situation, or I had no business speaking up. I really should have just kept my mouth shut. What is wrong with me? Why don't I know how to do this? Those voices, that on-repeat narrator in your head, if you will, That is happening for you on repeat because you're repeating that internalized dialogue that your mom had with you for years and years and years. For some of you listening, that voice may sound a little different. It may come with this core belief that you have to be better or do better in order to be loved. The idea that anybody loving you is transactional or because of something you did or how you showed up so that if somebody doesn't love you, it's because of something you didn't do or something you didn't say or how you didn't show up. And you might have grown accustomed to comparing yourself to other people, to minimizing your own experience by reminding yourself or telling yourself, it really wasn't that bad for me. You might find yourself in your current day telling yourself if you're irritated by something, it's really not that big of a deal. Other people have it so much worse. So many of you carry that voice in your head that whatever happened to you wasn't as bad as what happened to other people. As the show has gone on, I'm getting more and more letters from those of you listening and I'm looking forward to continuing to share them in in future episodes. And so many of these letters are starting with, it's totally okay if you don't read this. This letter is really long. You may not have the time. And it's so indicative of where everyone is at in their own narcissistic abuse recovery because you're not used to taking up space. You're not used to the idea that whatever you're thinking about or feeling or working through is important or is significant, and you tell yourself that other people's stories matter so much more. That's part of the narcissistic abuse recovery work, is to recognize that you matter, your story matters, 
and that what happened to you in your truth is just as important as somebody else's truth. There isn't somebody's worst truth or worst version of events. There's just, this is what happened to me. And that is important. Beginning, middle, and end. Every single time. And gaslighting yourself doesn't only look like beating yourself up. Sometimes gaslighting yourself is talking yourself out of being upset when your mom or someone else does something that you find disrespectful or hurtful. You might have found that you're really super accustomed to rationalizing the really poor, bad, and disrespectful decisions that other people make. And you might tell yourself something like they were just having a bad day or of course they didn't know how to do this. They have their own trauma. They didn't mean to be rude or dismissive of me. They had poor childhoods or they had bad things happen to them. So of course they're going to treat me poorly. It's that narrative of giving other people the benefit of the doubt, but not giving yourself that same benefit of the doubt. I always say to the ladies that I see, we can have grace for people, but we also have to keep them in their place a little bit. And I think that one of the ways a lot of the women I talk to every day self-gaslight themselves is by giving the person who hurt them, their mother or other people, because again, I think a lot of when you have a narcissistic mother, I, I think that there's a lot of other people attached to this that could also have caused you harm. It's so easy to say, oh, this is the family problem or this is a generational problem. They couldn't help it. And so then as a result, because it's not their fault per se, you then absolve them of responsibility and you take their need to hold them accountable to you. Rather, you take that away because they've had it so bad and they quote unquote couldn't help themselves. Connected to this in a lot of ways and a lot of examples is this idea that you're likely too familiar with feeling guilty. You might find yourself chronically feeling guilty for being upset, for reacting, for existing. Guilt is likely a feeling that you've grown pretty accustomed to. I think a lot of the women that I talk to have this hyperactive guilt button where as soon as something happens, it's their fault, their responsibility, and they should have known differently. Your mom, she could never accept responsibility. And you're used to her always shifting that responsibility to others. And often she shifted it to you. So you've grown so accustomed to thinking that everything's your fault because for the longest time, your mom applied this to you or outright told you it was your fault. Some of you are used to doing that big of a number on yourselves because it's just become so habitual. And at this point, you might not even realize you're doing it. When I started this show, it was really important to me that I offer a different voice, and a different way of talking about this topic. Because I think a lot of times when we see social media posts, read self-help books, or watch YouTube videos, narcissism in particular, I see it get sensationalized a lot. And I see people who are offering information, they're doing this thing where they're dumping and running. So they're saying the thing where everyone's like, oh yes, gaslighting. And then they get the likes, they get the comments, they get the shares. And it's like this dump and run because once everyone has rallied around the term gaslighting, we all feel seen, we all feel validated. It gets that engagement, it gets that intention. And then everybody kind of moves on. But that's not what I want for this show. I'm not looking to be like, hey, stop gaslighting yourself. And I'm not going to just dump that and run. I want to have the conversation. So we've called it out. We're talking about it. Now, what the heck do we do about it? Because after a lifetime of minimizing or denying your own emotions, how do you learn to validate them and see them through? You don't really see that a lot on social media. And that is why I'm having this conversation. And it's a huge reason why I've started this show. As I was thinking about this and outlining this episode for all of you, this really cool thing happened and it happened very organically. I want to introduce you to what going forward, we're going to start calling slow and steady strategies for narcissistic abuse recovery. All of these tools and strategies that I'm going to be talking to you about in this episode, I started keeping on a notepad 
And I realized that they're becoming a collection of skills that you won't just need and use for the sake of this episode or for the purpose of this conversation. I think we're starting to build a toolbox. And in all honesty, this is something I wish I had thought before the first episode, because I think I am teaching you a lot of tools and strategies. And one of the ways I want you to start thinking about this is that slow and steady wins the race. That this isn't something where I'm going to be able to say this in that quick, snackable social media style, and you're going to feel so seen and validated that you're going to be able to pick it right up and run with it. None of these things are going to change your life in an instant or overnight. Because again, what we're talking about here is we're breaking up habits, habitual, internalized ways of looking at yourself, looking at the world around you and considering your own thoughts, feelings, and experiences. In order to break habits, we have to do habit breaking on repeat, and it's not going to happen quickly. So the idea that we're building these slow and steady strategies for narcissistic abuse recovery sounds just about right, and I'm really looking forward to introducing you to them. I'll be turning each of the skills we're talking about into its own little flashcard. So you'll be able to get the downloadable link in the show notes. You'll be able to find that. And my thought and my intention is that as I talk about other slow and steady strategies in future episodes, this will be a document that I regularly update for all of you. It's a link to Canva. It doesn't ask for your email. You can go directly to the link in show notes. And then as we're talking about these skills and tools and strategies, you will be able to pull from them so that if you find yourself in a situation where you don't know what to say, don't know what to do, or don't know how to be, you might be able to go through some of these and see which of the skills might be applicable to you or to your situation. With all that being said, and like I talked about back in our third episode together, our first slow and steady strategy is going to be starting with increased self-awareness. We want you to start paying more attention to your feelings and to be more curious about them. We want you to observe how you feel and respond to different situations and relationships. And we want you to start naming your feelings as you observe them, being careful not to judge them, label them, or censor them. We just want you to name them. A journal sometimes is a really good tool to use for this so that you can remember things as you get to know yourself more. So in situations, you're just getting curious. If you're trying something new, going to a new place, meeting somebody new, or in a familiar situation that you've never really considered for yourself, you're just going to ask yourself things like, how did I feel about that? What did it feel like in my body? How does this person make me feel? Is this a situation that gives me energy or takes energy from me? Do I feel safe and secure? Does this person or situation or place make me feel okay in my own skin? You just want to get curious. What was it like to be me in this place or this situation? How did it feel in my body? How did it feel in my heart? And how did it feel in my mind? Once you get used to naming and observing your feelings, We then want to use our next slow and steady strategy. And I'm just, for the sake of clarity and clear communication, we're going to call that one self-validation. Here's what self-validation looks like. After naming your feeling, you want to describe for yourself why it makes sense that you feel that way. This means you're practicing self-compassion. As I say that, as I accuse you of not being respectful for yourself or having a habit of not being particularly kind to yourself, I want to remind you that what we're talking about here is that you're struggling with a lot of internalized beliefs. You have these internalized and ingrained ways of thinking about yourself and your feelings And we're really looking to dismantle those beliefs and those habitual thoughts you have about yourself. So we want to remind you in the sake of this conversation, you're not responsible for your mother's feelings. You're not responsible for anybody else's feelings either. But when you catch yourself blaming yourself, beating yourself up, thinking critically about yourself, we want you to start replacing those critical thoughts and those critical words that you're using with more positive affirmations. 
Now, again, positive affirmations, it's another thing that sometimes in some circumstances can make me roll my eyes a little bit. But again, what we want to be doing, if you're so used to thinking something's always your fault, if you're so used to thinking you're the problem, in the same way that you have that thought on repeat, we have to start helping you have more positive, more realistic, more accurate thoughts about yourself and having those thoughts on repeat. That's why we're doing the affirmation thing. We want you to focus on things you like about yourself. We want you showing compassion for the struggles you're having. And then we're working on self-acceptance. We want you to remind yourself, for example, you're a work in progress. We're all works in progress. And if you took this long to have these internalized beliefs ingrained so deeply in you, it's going to take a while to get back out of that and to look at your thoughts and beliefs and feelings and all of these habitual things you have. We want you to start getting critical of them. Why am I beating myself up? Why am I being so mean to myself? What am I doing? Would I allow anybody to talk to my friend this way? If those of you listening are moms, Think about the narrative you have in your head about yourself and what would you ever do if your kid came home and said, so-and-so said this to me about me, so-and-so accused me of this. You'd probably be worried that your kid was getting bullied. I'm talking to you about gaslighting yourselves because you're bullying yourselves and I so want you to look at this critically and with a more judgmental eye on the habit of beating yourself up more than you are judging yourself. Self-compassion is one of those phrases that can often sound well and good for other people and not for you. So what does self-compassion look like in a way that doesn't make you roll your eyes or feel a little bit of vomit in your mouth? This is the way I think about it. If someone you loved spoke to you about feeling the way you were feeling in a particular situation, what might you say or what might you think? And then you make sure you're using that same language for yourself. I find that a lot of the women I work with, they're so much more compassionate for other people and way less judgmental of other people than they are for themselves. So if you can get in the habit and in the daily practice of using the same language for yourself, about your own feelings and your own experiences that you might use with someone else, you're getting practice at self-validating, you're getting better at self-compassion, and you're getting better at thinking of yourself and about yourself with more kindness and respect. This next part might feel a little tricky for you to listen to because it certainly feels a little tricky for me to be talking about. What I want to talk to you about is that we all have to recognize that whether or not we like it, whether or not we want it to be true, we really are the sum of the five people we spend the most time with. We're the sum of the five people whose voice we hear in our head, whose messaging we hear, whose example we see, whose attitudes we see, whose thoughts and opinions we hear. That includes ourselves, which is why we're having this conversation, because we spend the most time with ourselves and we're listening to that inner critic on repeat. But also, too, if we have this inner critic and we're surrounding ourselves with people who have this negative, critical worldview, or we're spending a lot of time with the narcissistic mom, then odds are you're hearing these habitual thoughts that you've internalized as your own voice. And then you're hearing them come out in other people. So then it becomes, it must really be true. And it's not. It's just who you're spending the most time with. And sometimes that's because trauma brain has taken over. And again, remember in previous episodes, but trauma brain seeks comfort. Trauma brain seeks familiarity. So it isn't surprising to me then when somebody tells me that they've been raised by a narcissistic mother, that they also end up telling me that they have friends who tend to be really op opinionated or critical, or they have partners that are opinionated or controlling or critical, because that worldview, that way of moving through the world feels familiar to you. So it ends up feeling like something you want and something you gravitate to. 
But in reality, it's just another habit. When we're looking at our lives and we're looking at how we have to stop gaslighting ourselves, one of the things we really have to start getting critical with ourselves about and honest with ourselves about is who are we spending the most time with? As hard and as awkward as this might be, paying attention to the people you spend the most time with is going to be our next slow and steady strategy. If you're surrounding yourself with highly critical people, people who have little tolerance or patience for perceived weakness in others, or people who don't value emotional wellness or mental strength, it's likely that your own journey for self-acceptance is going to get hijacked. So you have to look critically at who you spend your time with, how much time you spend with them, and are you surrounded by supportive and validating people? Just as you internalize negative messaging, you can internalize positive messaging. Ultimately, the voice I want you to hear is going to be yours, and I want your voice to be accepting, validating, compassionate, and understanding. But if you're not there yet, we can help you get there faster by ensuring you're surrounded by people who consider you, validate you, and encourage you. We also have to remember in this conversation that boundaries are the greatest act of self-care you have. It's always going to be one of our most significant slow and steady strategies. Most of us, when it comes to boundaries, are a work in progress when it comes to this. But if you're regularly checking in with yourself about your boundaries, ensuring for yourself that you really are paying attention to and responding to things that don't feel good, you're protecting yourself. And by watching yourself set and hold boundaries, that's going to reinforce for you that you were worthy and deserving of that protection. We see a change in our behavior, and that changes the way we think and feel. So if you allow yourself to do this and you tune into it often enough, you're going to start to internalize those self-validating beliefs and those self-compassionate beliefs that we so desperately want you to have. And I don't think it's just your thoughts and your feelings that you're invalidating when you do this and when you gaslight yourselves. I imagine that a fair amount of the gaslighting that you're doing, it comes when you're second guessing or doubting your own memories. Memories are, are kind of nebulous. They're a little bit fluid. They can't always be relied on, but it's also highly unlikely that you lived in this happy, loving, well-adjusted household and you're only remembering that you were invalidated, criticized, or made to feel small and insignificant. It is so unlikely that you're making the whole thing up. More than likely, you're getting some of the details off, but you probably have a very accurate picture of everything that went down and that continues to go down. Because remember what we've talked about in our previous episodes and our previous conversations about this. When we've talked about trauma, your perception is your truth. We treat your perception as real and true and valid. You remember how you felt growing up as a kid and what that was like for you. And we want to affirm that belief, that conversation, those memories and that experience as real, true, and valid. So here's how I want you thinking about this. When you catch yourself doubting or questioning your memory, we're going to use our next slow and steady strategy for this to help you validate your own experience. We want you to start hearing your own voice in these conversations the loudest. We want you acknowledging your memories. We want you recognizing yourself through your experience and that it's valid. One of the easiest ways to do this is actually to consider seeking out the support of a trusted friend or loved one. If anyone else knew your truth or was there as it was happening, talk to them about it. Obviously, in this example, we're only talking to the people who have your back and who listen to you and who took your side in things. I was just listening to this incredible episode, by the way. Um, Minka Kelly did an episode on Dax Shepard's Armchair Expert show. By the time you listen to this, it'll be a few episodes back. But I highly recommend this episode. It's really intense in her 
trauma experience. And so you might not be ready for how much she puts it out there. But she talked a lot about how as she was writing, she had to call people and be like, did this really happen? Because we can't make this shit up, basically. And so she went to people who were there at the time for validation of her experience. But going to people who were there or going back and talking to friends who listened to you and heard about your experience at the time, or even as you do this in adulthood, because it's not just childhood memories that we doubt. It could be the way we perceive something that happened at a potluck at the neighborhood gathering. But anybody that was there, you can ask and check in and say, hey, I've been having some feelings about this. It feels like it happened for me this way. Is that the way it went down for you too? Do you remember me talking about this? Does this sound familiar? It's okay to seek proof positive as you're looking to validate your own memory and your own experience. Doing this is for sure going to make you feel a little vulnerable. I practically feel vulnerable for you by even suggesting it. And I have to be honest, it's tempting for me just to say, trust yourself, believe in your truth, and that's all that matters. But we also know that really isn't true all the time. You can feel better faster by talking to other people who were also there. And I want that for you. I do worry in all honesty, that's a little bit of a setup, that if you don't trust the right people and you go to the wrong people, this whole thing blows up. Definitely use caution with the idea. But I do think that when you've experienced something, talking to other people who were there too is going to be important. I talked earlier about journaling, and I think this is for sure a good area and a good example of when journaling really becomes a reliable, helpful, slow, and steady strategy, particularly once you've gotten used to doing it over time and have journal entries that you can go back to. But journaling really can be a great way to counteract those times when you're doubting your memory and your experience. As you journal, don't be afraid to gather the evidence. It's okay to create concrete, observable, measurable examples of the things that have happened. Maybe you're going to be using emails or text messages or pictures or other tangible things for verification that say this happened, this was real. And working on self-compassion, it's always going to be that slow and steady strategy. We're going to help you cultivate self-compassion and self-kindness when you're feeling doubt about your memories creeping in. We want you to remind yourself it's common for survivors of abuse to question their own experience, but that doesn't mean it's all a lie. Just because you're questioning it doesn't mean that you have reason to doubt it. After a lifetime of considering your mom, you're likely so disconnected from your own gut and your own intuition, but part of narcissistic abuse recovery is learning to trust yourself again. For some of you, you're learning to trust yourselves for the very first time. Our gut instincts really can guide us closer to the truth. If something feels off or doesn't entirely align with your intuition, Start working on trusting that inner voice and listening to it and seeing what it has to say to you. Now, another significant way that I see daughters of narcissistic moms gaslighting themselves is when they deny themselves their own needs, pretend they don't have any, or otherwise minimize them. What does this look like? For some of you, you might find yourselves in this habit of invalidating your own personal boundaries. And you might be finding that you give out these free passes when someone steps on your boundary, invalidates a boundary, or overlooks a limit you've set. Calling this much attention to yourselves likely feels wildly unfamiliar. And your experience might be that being in the spotlight opens you up to attack. As a result, you might be minimizing your own achievements. You might hear yourself say that you didn't really do that well at something. You just got lucky or it was an easy day. You might minimize your own need to be seen, validated, or respected. And oftentimes that comes just out of habit, out of that internalized belief we've been talking about. But sometimes it also comes out of fear. 
self-care is a significant need that I think a lot of us talk ourselves out of needing. We think of it as something that is selfish, indulgent, or something we only allow ourselves to have time for when no one else needs anything. However, denying our own needs for self-care, we're failing to set ourselves up for success. We deny ourselves the oxygen and the things we need to be that best version of ourselves, and then we wonder why it feels so hard all the time. I, I want us to slow down for a second, especially for this next part, because it's a little bit of a doozy. It's something that actually makes me catch my breath a little bit when I hear about it in session. I know you need to hear these things, and I know it's important that I say these things out loud. I'm also, in saying these things out loud, speaking some of your most painful truths, and I'm saying the hard thing out loud, right? And you're probably not very used to saying the hard thing out loud, and I'm bringing these really hard things and these dark things to light. And while I'm talking about all these slow and steady strategies, and I'm giving you these skills, the, the reasons why we need them are because we're talking about really hard things. And I don't want to oversimplify that. I don't want you to ever think that I forget that as I run down this list of skills and strategies and ways your mom has affected you. I don't want to just talk at you. I am really looking and asking you to consider how you might be gaslighting yourselves. And that is a really big ask. And it is really personal. And it's really hard. Without you in the room with me like I do in session, I don't always know how the things I'm saying are being perceived or heard or understood. So I definitely want you to know that I know we're talking about some really hard stuff. And I know it's a big deal here when I say I think you're gaslighting yourself or I'm asking you to check in with yourselves about whether or not you might be gaslighting yourselves. Because I know this conversation is likely coming with some embarrassment, and it might even be coming with some shame. I want to remind you, because again, this is one of the reasons why I'm doing this show for all of you in the first place. Can we all just take a second and remember here that shame cannot exist in the light? Hiding your truth in the dark, it doesn't make it any less true. It just makes it harder to heal from. I'm going to keep talking but first, I get this sense that this is one of those times when we probably just have to take a deep breath together. One of those deep breaths you've heard me talk about in previous episodes when we're trying to do some somatic regulation and we're trying to calm ourselves down. I want you to start taking that deep breath, the kind of deep breath that starts at your toes. And I want you to just for a second bear with me, don't roll your eyes, but move that breath up your body. And remember for a second to pause at the top of your head and then slowly, slowly let that breath out and feel that breath as it moves down your neck, down your back, down the backs of your arms and out your feet. It's okay to pause this, me talking to you and the rest of this episode for a second so you can take a couple more of those deep breaths. Because these deep breaths are for sure going to help you calm down and they're, they're going to help you feel more mindful and they're going to help you ground yourself just a bit. This conversation we're having, it's trauma work, my friends. It's important when we're doing trauma work that we regulate ourselves regularly. We check in with ourselves to make sure that it's not too much and that we cue our bodies that we're safe that the trauma isn't happening again, and that what we're doing right now is learning tools and strategies so that the trauma doesn't touch us as deeply or intensely in the future. You can always pause this, and you're always welcome back when you're ready. I'm going to trust you that you know yourself and your limits. You get to say when, you get to say where, and you get to say stop. So if talking about all of this is starting to get just a little too much, I know these episodes are long. It's more my preferred style for delivery. I like to make a full point and know that I've covered something. But just because I'm delivering this content in a length of upwards of 30 to 60 minutes doesn't mean you have to sit and listen to this to 30 or 60 minutes. There are many therapy sessions, right? And so you might only be able to handle or listen to 20 or 
15 minutes at a time, and that's perfectly okay. You're always going to get to say when, you're always going to get to say where, and you're always going to be able to get to say stop. One of the hardest things I hear in session is when I hear women talk about unrealized dreams or paths in life that they wanted to take, but their mothers talked them out of it, or they lacked the confidence to pursue them after having a childhood that was marred by neglect and invalidation. Hearing those suppressed wishes, the dreams, the ambitions, because they weren't practical, because they cost too much money or would inconvenience other people, it just really gets me sometimes. And when I think about how these women gaslight their own needs, sometimes that is the most painful one that I hear. And so when I work with women on this, one of the things I do is I remind them that there really is no such thing as too late. I've gotten these emails recently since I started the show from women in their, in their 50s and their 60s. And next week, we're going to be covering one of those letters from one of those women. But these women fear it's too late for them, that they've lost their shot. Cutting off dreams or cutting off possibilities because of age, that's just another way you gaslight yourself. That's another story you tell yourself for why you can't follow a particular path. Now, can you be 50 and in your 60s and become an expert at something? Can you take a whole different career path? Perhaps not. But can you do a version of this or an iteration of it? More likely than not, when people tell themselves that their time has passed, that there's, it's too late for them, that's just a story they're telling themselves. And if they look at that belief or that story and that narrative they've created with a more critical eye, they start to see possibilities that they may not have previously considered. A lot of the slow and steady strategies we're talking about today are going to help you learn to validate your needs and tend to them. And it really is my intention for outlining this so clearly is to create these tangible, interchangeable strategies that you can all use in different situations to recover. I don't want you always feeling like every new thing that you experience or go through or every thought that occurs to you requires a new strategy or skill. They really are going to be able to be interchangeable and used in different situations. And in addition to the ones we've already talked about here, there's a few others that I really want to take some time to get to so that you can learn to better validate your needs and allow yourself to have them. Sometimes we have to get so basic. In a previous episode, I did a needs identifier and a boundaries checklist. And for the sake of this episode, I am going to link to it as well so that you will have those slow and steady strategies that we're talking about today. But you can also learn to identify your needs a little bit better too. And once you get used to and accustomed to identifying your needs or start to begin identifying your needs, it's likely that you're also going to have to start challenging those feelings of guilt or shame that come up when you start doing that. You want to remind yourself that taking care of yourself isn't selfish, but it's essential to your overall well-being. You want to allow yourself to let go of that falsely created sense of responsibility for everything and everyone that it started when you felt responsible and your mom made you responsible for her, but it leads to you feeling responsible for everyone else that's getting in the way of meeting your own needs. You want to start to question those feelings of guilt and start looking at that feeling of guilt with a more critical eye because you wouldn't deny your best friend. You wouldn't deny your kids. You wouldn't deny people you worked with the ability to take some time for self-care. And if you think other people deserve self-care and deserve to have their needs met, you do too. One of the things that I really rely on a lot as a slow and steady strategy is this idea of transparent communication, getting so clear with people that you tell them what you want them to think so you can stop worrying about what it is they think. I think so often one of the reasons why the self-gaslighting is able to so successfully take root and become this habitual way we think about things is because we 
swallow our truth and we swallow our experience and we create that internal narrative rather than saying things out loud, speaking our truths, talking about things, telling people what we want them to think so we can stop worrying about what it is they think. I also think it's really, really important, especially we're talking about slow and steady here. We're talking about this is stuff that's going to take some time. It took you this far to begin thinking about yourself in this way. It's going to take you some time to break the habit of thinking about yourself in a negative, critical way. It's going to take a little bit of time to start showing yourself some grace and to start showing yourself compassion. You're going to be using this hopefully as a daily practice, but as you're doing it and we're thinking about slow and steady winning the race, I really want you to start thinking about creating ways to celebrate and acknowledge small steps in progress. This means that you might begin doing this work by only prioritizing small needs and then gradually working your way up to the more significant ones. But what we want you to do is celebrate each step you take in honoring and meeting your needs, no matter how small they are. We want you getting in the habit of recognizing and acknowledging your progress along the way. I really like the idea of putting a stamp on something. So you lay claim to this happened. I did this. No matter what, it doesn't get taken away from me. So you learn to mark each win. Maybe you're putting a marble in a jar. Maybe you're making a journal of bullet points. But whatever you do, you start practicing the idea that you are someone who deserves to celebrate her wins and that your wins are worth celebrating. I can't talk about how y'all get in this tendency to gaslight yourselves if I'm not also going to talk about one of the major ways you all do this is by ignoring the red flags that you see in relationships. For the sake of this conversation, what I'm talking about here is that a red flag refers to that warning sign or indicator that you have usually in your gut or your belly that someone might be problematic or potentially harmful for you or to you. This person usually creates a reaction in you. The red flag refers to that intuitive feeling that you have that someone isn't treating you right or isn't representing themselves honestly. Someone creating that red flag feeling in you, they might be controlling, they might be disrespectful, they might be abusive. A red flag person might be someone who like isolates you from other people. They are really big fans of gaslighting you or they're otherwise manipulating you. And I can't cover all the ways that people look and sound like red flags for the sake of this episode. It's just important that I note that ignoring a red flag Telling yourself that you're overreacting to somebody, blaming your trauma on why you're so sensitive, or telling yourself that other people wouldn't be bothered by this. All of those conversations that you have in response to a red flag are ways that you gaslight yourself when you're in relationship with other people. The slow and steady strategy for this is they're big ones, right? Because they take time and they take practice and they're a much longer, larger discussion. But what we're going to do here is work on practicing trusting yourself and your gut by paying attention to and responding to those warning signs. That's going to look like paying attention to your boundaries, getting the support of other people who have your back, and holding yourself accountable to who you're letting into your life. You're going to be tempted to give so many people the benefit of the doubt, but that's oftentimes because your mom never gave you the benefit of the doubt. You know what it feels like to not be given the benefit of the doubt, so you find yourself overextending the benefit of the doubt because you never want to do to another person what your mom did to you. But more often than not, and more likely than not, that's you ignoring a red flag. You're going to doubt your gut. You're going to see their good intentions. And mostly, you're never going to want to put somebody in that same position that your mom put you to. But the other thing connected to that sometimes is as a result of surviving your mom, you have a really high threshold for pain. 
So just because you can handle the pain that someone might be bringing you, that doesn't mean you should. I get it. You might be so lonely and so longing that you ignore a red flag by telling yourself a story that having someone is better than having no one and that somehow the devil you know is better than the devil you don't see coming. These are all stories you've gotten used to telling yourselves for years and years and years. And I have seen women create these stories for all kinds of reasons to validate why they open the door to red flags. And it is likely going to take the slow and steady work and strategies we've been talking about today and then some to get you to stop. But for now, I'm saying it out loud. I'm encouraging you to do a self-examination of who you've been letting in, why you've been letting them in, and I'm asking you to check in with yourselves about whether or not they deserve to stay. You're not always going to be able to see your blind spots, but if you feel something and you're saying something and you're giving yourself permission to do something differently, we're not even talking about a blind spot because you're seeing it and you're feeling it, but you're allowing yourself to do something differently. Relationships are always going to come with compromise, but accepting a red flag or skipping over them That's not the kind of compromise we're talking about, my friends. And we're going to keep talking about this because I know this is a conversation that needs more time. Thanks so much for working through all of this with me today. I know I talked about really big and painful topics, but again, I want to remind you here that we're using self-compassion, we're using self-validation, and we're thinking about this in the frame of slow and steady. I'm going to be linking to those slow and steady strategies that I've talked about in the show notes. And if you need that needs navigator that I talked about earlier, you're going to find that there too in the show notes. Next week, we're back with another listener q and I'm going to be helping Nancy, not her real name. She's asking, how do you love yourself when your own mother couldn't love you? She was scapegoated in her family while her sister was the golden child. I have a feeling that you all know a little bit about that. What a profound thing we're doing here. I'm getting goosebumps as I even say next week we have another listener question. Building this community of women healing and recovery from narcissistic abuse, it means the world to me. I'm going to be helping Nancy next week and helping Nancy, I continue to help you too. We're all in this together. Thank you so much for today. I'm in it with you. Bye for now. I'm so grateful that you're here. You're right where you're supposed to be. At its heart, I'm hoping to use this show to build the community of women working together to heal from childhoods marked by maternal narcissism and emotional neglect. My goal for Mother Mayhem is that this show becomes an advice and mentoring-driven show where you share your questions, struggles, and stories, and I offer you direction for healing and recovery. That can't happen without your contributions. I invite you to send a recorded voice memo or write in an email with your questions and things you're struggling with. You can always find me over at heather at daughtersnpd.com. To connect further, I invite you to find me over at Instagram and occasionally on TikTok at daughtersnpd. If you know another woman who needs this conversation in her life, I'm going to ask that you share the show with her. You can help me get the word out with your reviews and social shares of the show, and I hope you'll consider doing so. Special thanks to Heather Clark for editing this show. She's in my head and knows what I meant to say when the words come out backwards. Thanks for your time today. I'm always in it with you. Bye for now.